most of the most of the report, so I don't you know miss any of the critical elements with you, and then um, I'll, I'll give an opportunity for everyone to ask questions uh, on on any subject that uh, anything that, that you feel is pertinent. Um, obviously, we're here today uh, uh, a grim topic: uh, the shooting death of David Gilberti, um, and I'm here to talk about that case, talk about what we uncovered through the facts and then my conclusions. Um, to my left is Chief Michael Landis, county, the Chief County Detective. Uh, he supervised the investigation uh, along with the, the county detectives in this case. And uh, Chief Bill Cease from uh, Lidditz Borough is here for his department as well. So I'll give you a, uh, a summary of the facts that we gleaned from all the, the witnesses and all the evidence that we uncovered. The Lancaster County Forensic Team came out and did um, a physical processing of the scene as well. Um, the key witnesses are obviously Officer Hartz and then Mrs. Gilberti, who was the grandmother uh, of the deceased in this case, and she's the one that actually called in. So Officer Hartz was the uh, sole working officer in Lidditzboro Police Department um, the morning of December 21st, 2013. He was dispatched to 101 Arrowhead Drive uh, on that Saturday at uh, 310 in the morning. Um, what he was told was that it was a 911 hang up uh, at that address. Nothing was said. The caller taker is trying to call back now. Officer Hartz left the station immediately after he was notified of the communication and arrived in uh, approximately two and a half minutes from the dispatch. He came to the door, was unable to get anyone to, uh, to answer uh, for about three and a half minutes. He was able to hear um, David Gilberti inside screaming and yelling throughout that time while he was trying to get entry. Um, communications stayed in touch with uh, Officer Hartz throughout that time. They verified he was on scene. And a few minutes later, the dispatcher um, told Officer Hartz that uh, Mrs. Gilberti, the grandmother, was back on the line stating that she needed assistance with her grandson. He told, um, Officer Hartz told the dispatcher to have her come to the front door. Uh, from what we could hear, it's clear that Mrs. Gilberti was unaware uh, that he was outside during that initial time period that he was outside, and uh, she's relieved that when she finds out that he is, and uh, she terminates the call and then admits him to the residence uh, at the front door. Officer Hart stated that Mr. Gilberti was standing at the top of the stairs, which is sort of as, almost as you come in, looking down directly on him. Um, the stairs lead from the foyer to the second level of the house. Officer Hartz reported that Mrs. Mrs. Galberti told him her grandson was going crazy. Um, Officer Hartz reported that uh, she, Mr. Galberti said, well, no one called the police. Um, he responded by saying, well, your grandmother called and asked him what the problem was. Um, he, told, uh, he told us that uh, Mr. Galberti, Mr. Galberti told him he was not allowed on the property and he wanted him to leave. Officer Hartz climbed the stairs while asking David um, to talk to him while he was while he was going up. Uh, it's important to note that Mrs. Uh, Gilberti corroborates uh, what Officer Hartz says here and stated that throughout the incident, Officer Hartz attempted numerous times to talk to her grandson and to, and to talk it out. Officer Hartz reported that uh, Mr. Gilberti stepped back away from the steps. Um, he asked him to do that, but uh, he didn't. He just kind of stood there and stared. Um, when the officer reached the top, he um, stated that uh, Mr. Garbotti told him um, he told him to come and sit down, and told Officer Hartz that he was going to kill him. So he asked him to come in, sit down, and that he was going to kill him. At this point, Officer Hartz took hold of Mr. Uh, Gilberti's right wrist. He tried to move him to the right towards the living room, away the top of the from the top of the stairs. Basically, you go right from the stairs into the living room. Um, it's right there and of course wanted to get away from a potential fall down the stairs. He reported that Mr. Gilberti immediately grabbed at his service weapon uh, with both hands and tried to remove it from the officer's holster. He had a retention holster um, so that prevented the weapon from, from coming into the hands of David Gilberti and but it was basically right from the beginning. He's uh, already told him he's going to kill him and he's grabbing for his weapon. Uh, moments after he arrived at the, at the location. Officer Hartz had a flashlight in his hand. Um, he made a fist and he struck Mr. Gilberti in the face, uh, but uh, David continued to struggle. He tried to push Mr. Gilberti off him and they ended up falling on the sofa. Um, he pushed uh, David away and onto the sofa and 
he, he indicated that things calmed down uh, briefly. At that point in time, uh, David again tells him to lie down, he tells Officer Hartz to lie down and that he's going to kill him. Uh, the officer reported that Mr. Gilberti, Mr. Gilberti sprung up at him and again tried to, uh, tried to grab his weapon and get it from him. He reported Officer Hartz said he grabbed Mr. Gilberti's hand and punched him in the face and was able to push him down on the sofa again and was restraining him by pushing against um, David's throat and arm. Officer Hartz's radio was equipped with a shoulder microphone and during the struggle with Mr. Gilberti, uh, the microphone's clip pulled away from the coat and was dangling on the end of the cable. He had difficulty reaching his microphone to call assistance uh, during, this, during this struggle. Approximately 3.18 in the morning, um, Officer Hertz is heard making a call, an excited call to the county, and the dispatcher acknowledges, and then uh, a brief inaudible transmission is heard. Dispatcher attempts to call back three times, but there's no response. At this time, at 3.20 in the morning, Officer Anthony Smith of the Northern uh, Lancaster County Police Department uh, said that he's responding to the location. At 3.21, um, officer Hartz calls communication and asks for backup um, ASAP. The officer is told that an, another officer is on, on route um, and asks uh, whether he wishes another unit to come and, he, and the officer Hart says yes. Uh, the officer, while he remembers calling for assistance, he cannot say uh, when during uh, the altercation. Uh, the transmission is, is um, just pro pro probably very pri right prior to David arming himself with a knife. Officer Hartz then reported that Mr. Gilberti continued to tell him that he was going to kill him. Officer Hartz stood up and reports that Mr. Gilberti popped up again for the third time, attempted to grab his uh, service weapon. Officer Hartz reported he got Mr. Gilberti in a chokehold, but he continued to struggle with him, so he pushed him away from him. Uh, again, Mr. Gilberti came back at him, and they again began to struggle, uh, described it as wrestling. He, Officer Hart stated that he pushed David away from him. He drew his taser at this point in time, and he fired at Mr. Gilliberti. He reported um, that he repeatedly attempted to deliver shocks with no apparent effect whatsoever on Mr. Gilliberti. Um, again, Officer Hart reported that Mr. Gilliberti once again tried to grab the, his service weapon from him with both hands. Uh, we were able to look at the data from the taser, and it reveals um, three five-second duration activations from the device, and at the time of the autopsy was found that two probes uh, fired by the taser did in fact strike Mr. Gilberti uh, in the chest. And again, there was absolutely no effect on David by the use of the taser. Officer Hartz reported that he then resumed uh, punching Mr. Gilberti and again forced him down on the sofa and was actually on top of, of David. He said that Mr. Gilberti appeared to calm briefly, but he continued to tell him the officer that he was going to kill him and made his fingers in the shape of a gun uh, and began actually hitting the officer on the side of his head and at this point actually knocked Officer Hartz's glasses off of his face. At this point in time, Officer Hartz reported that he was beginning to get tired from all the struggling with the much younger man. Officer Hartz reported that he stood up and Mr. Gilliberti then also got up and went, Mr. Gilliberti went into the kitchen through an opening from the living room. He reappeared seconds later through that opening um, to the kitchen, which is at the top of the stairs. Officer Hart stated he could immediately see that Mr. Gilliberti had a knife with a large blade um, in his hand and was holding, uh, was holding it down, at, at least initially. Um, Mrs. Gilliberti told the officers that she was actually standing on the stairs and could see her grandson uh, come out of the kitchen holding the knife at his side. At this point, Mrs. Gilliberti went down the stairs to the front door to see if additional officers uh, were, were coming to let them in. Officer Hartz then stated that Mr. Gil Gilberti advanced towards him, so he actually um, takes a step back, and at this point in time, and only at this point in time, does he first draw his service weapon. He reported that um, Mr. he told Mr. Gilberti to drop the knife and get down on the floor, but uh, David instead raised the knife uh, from his side uh, to this, to, to the side of his head with the blade facing towards the officer, and uh, it began and continued to advance on um, Officer Hartz again stating that he was going to kill the officer. Officer Hartz stated he continued to back away towards the opening between the living room um, to the kitchen, which is at the end of the house, and he reported when he stepped back into the kitchen, uh, Mr. Gilberti was directly in front of him, at which time he, had to, he fired his handgun twice at Mr. Gilberti's chest. 
And you have to understand that this, this is a very, when I talk about these different rooms, we're talking about a very small area in the home. Everything's very, very close range. There's only a few feet um, distance between these individuals. Officer Hartz reported uh, that the two shots appeared to have absolutely no effect on uh, David. And to quote him, he said, he didn't go down and it didn't even look like it phased him. He was almost smiling at me. Officer Hartz reported that Mr. Gilberti lurched forward, so he fired two more times. The officer reports he could see the actual impact of the bullets move Mr. Gilberti's shoulders back. Um, officer Hartz then stated it then, Mr. Gilberti still then took another half step toward him and he fired three more times. Officer Hartz reported that Mr. Gilberti then sat down. The knife was still in his hand um, and he laid back and eventually let go of the knife. Mr. Mrs. Gilberti had come up at this point in time and she actually kicked the knife away from her grandson. Officer Hartz Mr. reported that um, Mr. Gilberti came back up to a sitting position and actually tried to, <coughs> to push up again but was unable to do so and fell back. Officer Hartz reported that um, when Mrs. Gilberti kicked the knife away, he called, uh, he talked to communications uh, that shots had been fired and that actually took place at 323 uh, in the morning or about 12 minutes and 50 seconds uh, into the call. Officer Hart stated he had been constantly ordering Mr. Gilberti to drop the knife and get down on the floor from the time Mr. Gilberti appeared with the knife. Uh, officer Anthony Smith was the next officer on scene and he arrived within seconds after the shots fired broadcast. He found Officer Hart standing in the dining room with his weapon at the low ready position. Um, this is a position that's used to allow a clear view of threat while permitting the weapon to be quickly raised if there's a need to fire. In his statement, uh, which stood out to me, uh, one of the things Officer S uh, Smith stated was that, that Officer Hartz looked white as a ghost and the observations um, of him and his demeanor by Mrs. Gilberti and Officer Smith are obviously consistent with seeing somebody who had just been, had an extremely traumatic experience. Um, to go into what prompted the call just briefly after talking to Mrs. Gilberti, we discovered that uh, she said she woke up at about 3.30 in the morning. It had to be obviously prior to that based on the call to the, uh, to the dispatch. She noticed that lights and television were on downstairs and uh, David was, uh, was staying with her obviously at the time. So she got up to check on her grandson and found him watching television with uh, sunglasses on. She said that she asked him why he was wearing sunglasses and he told, him, told her it helped him relax. She stated that David came back upstairs with her and asked where um, his grandfather was. Um, his grandfather had passed, actually had passed away, um, but she said she didn't want to tell him that he had passed away years ago, so she told him that he was working. Mrs. Gilberti stated that David asked her what time it was. She said 3.30 in the morning, asked him what he wanted. He said he wanted to eat, so she made him some eggs and waffles. Uh, she then told us that um, David asked her why it was 4 o'clock in the morning. She said because it was 4 o'clock in the morning. She stated she told David to go downstairs and go to bed, but he sat down in a chair in the living room and picked up a phone. She asked David um, who he was calling. He said there were people outside, a lot of people, a truck, and a weapon. She told him that no one was outside and she didn't see anybody. She looked out there and said no one was out there. Um, Mrs. Galberti then stated that David asked her if, he, if she had any weapons and if they had any weapons and she said they did not. She stated that David um, had obviously scared her. All this um, was troubling to her, especially when he asked about weapons. So she went downstairs, um, got the other phone and went out to the garage to call uh, 911. Um, Mrs. Gilberti was asked why she went to the garage uh, to call 911. She stated, when David asked me if we had a weapon, I realized something was going on with David and I wanted things to be safe for me and for him. I called in the garage uh, so he didn't hear me calling. After a number of attempts to call 911 during the calls, which were terminated for unknown reasons, she did finally speak with a 911 uh, call taker and she, she said, I need help right now. My grandson is freaking out, please hurry. That's what actually got through. Um, she told interviewers that her grandson suffered from bipolar disorder and was taking medication, which she says she made sure that he took. Um, and she said she had made sure he had taken him earlier that day. There had been uh, prior call outs to that residence involving David that I've listed in the report, um, both on June, 
uh, June 15th to within a short time period and then August of the 31st. Um, the details are in there. The essence of them is he's making unusual comments, acting strange, exhibiting evidence of uh, mental illness uh, to include that he was rubbing citrus and, and orange peels um, in his hair because of his, his dry skin. Um, there was nothing in these calls uh, that, that indicated a, a threat uh, to the police or to anybody other than obviously uh, he's a mentally disturbed individual. Um, the details are in there uh, and, and if you, if you want, or want to read them, but uh, she, had, she had called them uh, twice before. As I say, um, there's nothing in those reports that suggested that David uh, was threatening or violent in any, any fashion. Um, clearly, however, uh, on this particular occasion, she, the grandmother had expressed she feared. Uh, she, she had concern for her grandson, feared for her grandson, and then in this one she was now fearing for herself as well. Um, we did find evidence from the search that he was undergoing treatment for psychiatric issues, for schizophrenia, um, and Mrs. Galavardi had reported the bipolar disorder. What stands out is that he had been prescribed an antipsychotic medication, um, res Respiradol, I'm not sure, I assume that's how you pronounce it. Um, the records also suggest he's capable of losing touch with reality, uh, being aggressive, risky, and potentially uh, dangerous. When we did the physical reconstruction uh, of the scene, uh, as I noted, as I, I indicated, it's a very small area. When you go up the stairs, you're immediately facing into the kitchen, and then uh, to your right, immediately at the top of the stairs, is the living room, and then just behind that is sort of is, is a dining area. It's all very close. Uh, there, it is not a large location. What stood out to us is um, the technicians found six locations where the bullet had actually impacted the wall, and uh, in one case, uh, a piece of furniture. Five of those uh, impacts are the presence of blood or flesh, indicating that they had actually passed through uh, Mr. Gilliberti's body completely. Uh, and, and what kind of stood out, and, and to make sort of, and it's all written down there um, in, in detail, but what in essence they were able to find matched up with what Officer Hart stated. So as Officer Hart's basically was describing as David is coming towards him with the knife, he's tracking him with the weapon and he's also backing up. And what you could see from the bullet patterns on the wall directly across from where Officer Hart's was, was consistent with that. So as he's firing, they're both moving uh, to a slight degree, so the pattern goes um, across, across the wall, and you can see the bullets impacting um, a, a, a few inches um, or a foot or so apart, which is entirely consistent um, with the description of Officer Hart's. We also found his flashlight there, along with his eyeglasses and the, the taser with the spent uh, cartridge. The autopsy was performed um, on December 23rd by Dr. Wayne Ross. Uh, he found multiple contusions to David Gilberti's face, consistent with the physical struggle that he had been punched. Um, he also, as I had indicated, found evidence of, uh, of the, that he had been tasered. Um, Mr. Gilberti also had multiple abrasions and contusions, again, consistent with, um, with the struggle. Uh, again, he had, the, he had burn marks consistent with the contacts from, uh, from the taser that, again, I had indicated had absolutely no um, effect on him. He found that Mr. Gilberti had sustained six gunshot wounds to the upper right chest area. There uh, was a very tight shot group, uh, all within close, close proximity to each other. Five of them had passed completely through. One bullet was found uh, still inside under the skin of the back. That bullet was um, recovered. The bullets were all front to back and slightly downward. Officer Hartz is a couple inches taller uh, than, than David, so that would be uh, consistent. One thing of particular note is that Dr. Ross, Ross found what is called stippling to the right side of Mr. Uh, Gilliberti's face and neck, and this indicates that at least one or more of the shots that was fired was it fired at a range of two feet or less. Um, and that corroborates the account provided by Officer Hartz and also exhibits just how dangerous this situation was and how determined David Gilberti was. There's details about the toxicology and what we found there. Um, in essence, a lot of over-the-counter cough medication. What uh, really stands out and really stood out to us uh, and to me as far as this report 
from the toxicology, and this is one of the reasons we waited uh, till now to, to announce the, uh, these findings, was that there was an evidence of his antipsychotic medication uh, in his blood, so he was not taking his, uh, his medications. Mrs. Galberti was under the belief that she was making sure that he was taking it. In fact, had she had made sure that he had taken it that day, but clearly he was going to, to efforts to conceal it and was not taking his medication. I've outlined in the report um, in detail the, the relevant legal standards. It's pretty simple. In this case, what we're talking about is if you're an imminent uh, reasonable belief of imminent uh, death or serious bodily injury to yourself, you can use deadly force, and that's what applies uh, in this case to this officer as it would to anybody. <coughs> so my conclusions are as follows. Um, the investigation found that he responded to 101 Arrowhead Drive for an unknown problem after 911 had received a hang-up call to that address. Officer Hartz would have had no way of knowing whether Mr. Gilliberti was an immediate threat to someone in the house uh, without entering the house. Upon entering, he immediately encountered David Gilliberti, and based on the facts the officer knew at the time, his decision to enter, home, enter that home was entirely understandable. The investigation found no contradictions in the account of the incident as provided by Officer Hartz and Crispina Gilliberti, the grandmother of deceased, uh, who witnessed nearly all the altercation between her grandson and Officer Hartz, except for the uh, actual shooting, as I had indicated, she had gone downstairs to wait for um, the more backup police officers to arrive. She did not witness the actual shooting because she uh, was down at that door. She did, however, see her grandson walking from the kitchen towards Officer Hartz with a knife in his hand um, as she stood down at the bottom of the stairs. She came up to the first. Uh, she came up to the first floor immediately after hearing the shots and saw Officer Hartz. She described Officer Hartz as shaking and she kicked the knife away from her grandson's reach. The, officer, the observations of Officer Hart's demeanor by Mrs. Gilliberti and Officer Smith that are obviously consistent with someone who has just had an extremely traumatic experience. The account of the confrontation given by Officer Hartz and Mrs. Gilliberti along with the scene condition, the physical evidence found at the scene, and the autopsy findings clearly show that Officer Hartz made an extraordinary effort to subdue and restrain Mr. Gilliberti, a man 26 younger, years younger than himself. It's clear that there was a violent and protracted struggle. Mr. Gilliberti's repeated threats that he intended to kill the officer and his determined efforts to obtain control of the service weapon of the officer would cause any reasonable person to believe that they were fighting for their life. Mr. Gilliberti showed little effect from repeated blows by Officer Hartz, nor did he show any reaction to the use of the taser. And it was clear that at this point in time, David Gilliberti had a significant tolerance to pain. When Mr. Gilliberti appeared with the knife, he was no way deterred from advancing on Officer Hartz by the officer's drawn handgun. Current uh, police training dictates that once an officer believes he must fire his weapon to prevent his death or that of another person, he is to continue firing until the threat is incapacitated. There is currently no handgun round practical for law enforcement use that is capable of causing immediate incapacitation absent a bullet striking the base of someone's brain. And numerous studies have, have shown, and we've seen it here ourselves, that despite mortal wounds, individuals are still able to carry on an attack and inflict fatal wounds on the individuals they are targeting. In this case, Officer Hartz instinctively followed his tactical training he was given and he aimed for center mass. That's what he hit. Um, the large area of the body containing multiple organs. Officer is instructed to aim for that center mass because it provides a large aiming surface and is likely to cause injuries uh, sufficiently serious that it will lead to incapacitation. The officer, however, began retreating and fired two shots and stopped only to have Mr. Gilliberti continue to advance with the knife raised over his head. And this clearly demonstrates demonstrate restraint. Mr. Gilliberti continued to advance, ignoring repeated orders to drop the knife. The officer fired two more times. Again, David continued to advance, and it was only then that Officer fired, Officer Hartz fired until Mr. Gilliberti fell. So in other words, he actually showed more restraint than what the training is. At that point in time, once the decision to fire, the training is to fire until he's incapacitated. He fired two, it had no effect. He retreated, it didn't work. He did it again, stopped, and, and showed again incredible restraint, with his life on, literally on the line. After careful review of the facts and the attendant law, Officer Hartz was clearly justified in the use of deadly force against Mr. Gilliberti. Officer Hartz had every reason to believe that his life was in an immediate peril. Without question, Officer Hartz was faced with an individual intent upon killing him or forcing him, the officer, to kill Mr. Gilliberti. In fact, I am convinced that if Mr. Gilliberti had been able to grab the firearm or to use the, the knife that he had had, he absolutely would have murdered Officer Hartz. The use of deadly force was justified 
uh, because the attack of Mr. Gelabarti with a large knife, as well as Mr. Gelabarti's repeated threats to kill, his refusal to respond to commands to put the knife down, his refusal to be deterred after physical conflict, as well as his refusal to be deterred after being tased numerous times. The fact that Mr. Gelabarti continued to advance on Officer Hartz after being shot numerous times proved David's malicious intent. All of the above led Officer Hartz to reasonably believe that the use of deadly force was necessary to prevent a direct threat of death or serious bodily injury to himself. Officer Hartz showed tremendous restraint in his responses and attempted unsuccessfully to resolve the situation with communication, hand-to-hand -hand struggle, as well as the use of taser prying to deploying and using deadly force. Officer Hartz exhibited exceptional, critical, and proper decision-making and attempted to de-escalate the level of force. The reason he was forced to use deadly force rests solely with Mr. Gilliberti. The loss of life in this case is regrettable, it's tragic, but it was unavoidable and completely justified. I want to thank um, the uh, county detectives, and particularly Chief Landis, for preparing um, a, a detailed uh, report on this and conducting the investigation. Lidditsboro for, for, and Chief Cease for their cooperation and just make a comment before I open up the question that an incident like this is a real uh, stark reminder of just how dangerous a job uh, the men and women that decide to take on, uh, take the uniform, wear the badge, and go out to protect each and every one of us 24-7 uh, and, and how much risk they face and that a simple call uh, of responding to a house uh, can turn into an officer facing death within seconds upon arrival with really no clue beforehand. So we owe a debt of, debt of gratitude to all those men and women uh, in uniform in our county and throughout the country. And um, I'll take that opportunity to say that right now and, and I'll uh, open it up for questions. Why do you think the taser didn't work? I think, my, I mean, my speculation would be he was you know, obviously in a psychotic uh, episode and, and my guess is that contributed to his tolerance for pain. Um, there's some evidence as well that the uh, probes, since it was so close range, the probes are more effective if they're actually spread apart so there's more area to shock. And since they were so close, um, the, they didn't have a lot of time or space to, to have a big separation. So they were close together, so that would have minimized some of the pain. Now that didn't make any difference to what's called drive stun, which is basically the contact tasers, which he was doing. That had no effect as well. Uh, on him. Obviously, it didn't deter him whatsoever. I mean, he was shot numerous times and it didn't deter him. I mean, the bullets were going through them, and, it, and if that's not going to stop somebody, I mean, there was nothing that was going to stop him but essentially death. And unfortunately, that's what took place. So he was shot with the taser and also, like, touched yeah. with the taser. So how many times was each? Do you know? Three, three, t three times total, I believe. Yeah. How is the officer doing? I mean, you describe it almost like a scene out of the movie where he gets up one last time after he's shot. I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, I, I think there's no question that uh, he was traumatized by this, as the one uh, officer said he was, he was white as a ghost when he got there. I mean, we're, we're not, I wish we were talking about a movie here, um, because it sounds like something right out of a movie, but this is real life, and he truly experienced this. I mean, I mean could you uh, imagine yourself, someone threatening to kill you, trying to take a weapon from you, coming at you with a knife, saying they're going to kill you, you're shooting them multiple times, and they're continuing to advance on you. Um, uh, we would all be terrified, we'd all be traumatized, and uh, only he truly knows the level. But uh, as I said, I mean, it really, it does seem like it, it's out of a movie. And, and it happened here. Has the, has the officer been on, what's his status been since the shooting, and what will it be after? I'm gonna let the chief answer that. Uh, he's on administrative leave um, and workers' comp. Uh, and uh, right now he's still on workers' comp and, and hasn't returned to duty. So. Is his intentions to do so at some point, or is it kind of in a problem? We don't know that. Um, we won't know that till later. And what type of experience are we talking about? Like how long has he been on the force for? He's been on the force for 24 years. And how old is the officer? Uh, 47, I believe. I know there was some sort of language barrier barrier talked about with the grandmother here. Could there have been some miscommunication about she said she thought she had given him his medicine? Was she the sole caretaker of him? Was she the one supposed to be making sure? And is there a bigger issue here with mental illness? And well, obviously, the heart of this is, is mental illness behind all of it. Um, 
there was some uh, some <laughs> language difficulty. There's no question that she told the investigators that she was uh, giving him his medication, making sure that he took his medication every day. I mean, he this was not a a surprise to her or the family. He had been struggling with mental illness for some time, um, but was up here living with her. Uh, there are uh, parents, I believe, living in Florida. I don't know what the particulars are, or why he was up here, who made that decision, but he was living up here with his, his grandmother. She was the sole uh, caretaker, so to speak. How long he, had he been living there? Uh, Chief, do you? I think about six months. Six months. Six months. Okay. Under, had he been? Uh, receiving medical treatment for that mental illness for a while or I mean, obviously had medications yes I mean I, I don't know whether I have the information about how long but it was very clear that he had been had sought treatment uh, for some time and, and was getting uh, some treatment I don't have we don't have all his his uh, records what we have is what we were able to find and what she was able to tell us but there's no question the family was aware of mental illness and that he had a medic uh, prescription for it Craig, did the coroner elaborate on how someone could take six shots to the chest and still be functional? I mean, have you seen anything like that before? Uh, yeah, we've had cases where, where, I mean, people just don't go down right away um, or die right away if you don't hit basically the brain, the base of the brain and incapacitate. Even people that have taken bullets in the heart can take some steps for some time. Um, it depends on their mental state, their physical conditioning, and, and in this particular case, I, I can I think it's fair to say that his psychotic state um, helped him stay up, helped him hurt him, whatever however you want to characterize it. Um, uh, as I said, what stands out to me is the is the fear Officer Hartz must have faced uh, shooting somebody, and he's hitting him, you know, right here, and and every shot that hit him, so he hit six out of the seven shots he fired, he only missed once, and they were all a very tight shot group. Uh, right in his, his chest and have him not stop uh, I mean it's it's that's that's extraordinary sure every one of these situations you uh, afterwards you take and you look at it and you try to learn from it what, what will you guys take away from this do differently not do differently you know talk about for training in the future I'm not sure that in this particular case, you know, obviously we defer to the, the police officers to my left here, um, but in this particular case, I think he handled himself extraordinarily well. Um, I'm not sure what else he could have done. I mean, he tried from communication. He's got to respond to that call. We have a call for assistance. She's saying he's going crazy. He can hear the, the person going crazy inside. I'm not sure um, what else he could have done. He, In fact, he went above and beyond uh, the multiple physical struggles he's in with a guy um, less than half his age, uh, and and, uh, and he, he used great restraint before deploying, uh, even pulling out his weapon to tell him to, to stop. Um, so I think actually the training would be uh, to show how to the lengths he went here and uh, I think there should be some discussion on firing and, and a reminder to the police to fire until the person's incapacitated because they were in such close proximity as we've indicated the autopsy is indicating that one of the shots was at least one was fired within two feet. Well two feet I mean, you can stab somebody two feet away, and, and if anything, you know, he might have shown too much restraint. And of course, that's easy for us to say, easy for me to say, not being in that situation. No police officer wants to be facing this situation. No police officer wants to take anybody's life. Um, it clearly, with this officer, was it was the absolute last resort. And um, I mean, it does, in a broader perspective, show us that we, you know, we have just a, a continuing problem with mental illness in our in our society and that's not going to go away anytime soon and that's a that's a, a broader discussion than law enforcement I mean he had to deal with that mental illness that that you know at that point in time we have an immediate threat we have somebody losing control it's not time for um, counseling in fact he was refusing to take his medication so it's really unfortunate Anything else? When you say service weapon, you just mean gun, right? His handgun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his microphone, you said, fell off. Like his radio. There's a. There's a. A lot of them have a. It's like right. The transmitter's right on their shoulder. There's like a, a loop or something that holds it there. And during the struggle, that fell off. So he was probably at different points in time having trouble reaching that. Because typically you can just reach up and call, like this. But once the physical struggle, that thing was 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 pulled off, you know, or fell off. And so it, it caused a little bit of a problem with, uh, with him trying to get in communication.
that was maybe the delay in backup coming? No. No. Okay. It's a handheld mic that's an extension, uh, radio extension. It's usually held right about here on the, on the uh, shoulder pads, and that uh, ripped off the or pulled away from the uh, the officer's shoulder or lapel. Uh, we've taken steps and, and bought a, uh, um, a holder that will hold it in place. Uh, so we've taken steps to do that. Uh, and, and equipped our officers with this uh, special um, um, device, so that won't happen again, or at least, hopefully, won't happen again. So, so did he, was he trying to use it at all, or this was probably a, you know a cumbersome? There, there was a radio transmission from Officer Hart. Yeah. It clearly came from him. They couldn't clearly hear what he was. It was very excited. They tried to respond back to him, and here again is where everything occurred the way it should have. County radio never dispatched a backup officer. Before they could even do that, a neighboring department officer heard what was going on and said, I'm responding to the scene. They didn't even have to, to do that. What department was that, Dan? Northern Regional. That's right. 